ability to get along with each other and how it pertains to the unity of the church. And so that's where we're headed today. Uh, we thank you for uh, joining us here today. And if you've joined us online, we thank you for being there as well. We hope that you'll uh, take a minute, that you'll share the stream if you're on Facebook with us. If you're here in the space, um, we encourage you to uh, just check in with us on Facebook as well. The ushers are going to come around and share with you the red attendance pads. We hope that you'll take a moment and let people know, let us know uh, that you've been here by signing that pad. And on the, uh, if you are new, if you'd like to share your contact information, we'd love to be able to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. So we hope that you'll give us the opportunity to do that. If you're online, um, the digital equivalent of the uh, red attendance pad is at medfordumc.org slash online dash attendance. You can also get there through the app. And if you haven't downloaded the app, we encourage you to download that. You can receive a daily devotional. You can manage your giving. You can catch up on worship content, catch up on things that are going on here at the church. And it's real easy to do. You text Medford app, all one word, Medford app to 833-700-2226. And if you'd like to make a gift to support our ministry, uh, you can, again, use the app. You can visit our website at medfordumc.org slash give. Uh, you can drop uh, something in the offering plate, or you can mail a check to us at 2 Hartford Road, Medford, New Jersey, 08055. So a couple of announcements. So over the next couple of weeks, we're working on planning our uh, sermons for the next uh, year. And so if you have ideas, we would love to hear from you. Uh, there's a link in the Friday email that we sent out. And the Friday email is also in the app, and you can get it. Uh, you can get the link there. Uh, we'll also take a moment and uh, share that link on Facebook as well, so you can look for it there. But just a very simple survey that we put together, so that you can provide some feedback about what's been meaningful to you and what you might like to hear more about over the next couple of uh, months. So we look forward to hearing back from you. The United Women in Faith are gearing up for their fall uh, fundraiser, and it's a move-a-thon. We've been doing it for the past uh, two years, so this will be our third year doing what's called Push Your Tush. And uh, so it's an opportunity for us to get active and also to be uh, connected to one another. So we've got lots of events planned around that. And it's a fundraiser for uh, this year for our scholarship fund. So we are really grateful for your participation in it. Right now, what the United Women in Faith are looking for are some folks to participate on the team to help with the planning, and then also to uh, have event sponsors. If you have a business and you'd like to sponsor uh, this event, we would love to have uh, your participation in that. And if you would like to get involved, you can contact Barb Carlson. I'm not sure if Barb is here. Right here is Barb. So you can contact Barb Carlson, talk with her uh, after the service. Or if you uh, forget about that, you don't get to connect this week, um, please reach out to the church office. So let's begin this morning uh, with the call to worship. And I'll invite uh, Glenn, will you lead us into call to worship this morning as we get started? Good morning. We all stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you are called. We, we cannot do this alone. alone. We, we dare, dare not try this alone. alone. So, so we, we gather, gather as God's people. people. Lead a life worthy of your calling, a life filled with sacrifice and meekness. We come, we come to, to build, build up Christ's Christ body in humility and gentleness, with patience and love. Lead a life which reflects your calling, that life of peace grounded in the Spirit. We rejoice in our oneness in Christ. We would we share the grace offered to us. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We gather as God's family at the table prepared for us, waiting to be fed by the bread of life. So we've been having issues with the organ this summer, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and now it's just decided to stop. <laughs> so we're going to go piano today. Okay. And uh, hopefully it works. You jinxed it a little earlier. Yeah, I asked. I specifically asked, how's the organ today? <laughs>
Do you join me in the opening prayer? One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Take this patchwork collection of persons and quilt together your church. Like all pieces of cloth, take these words and songs and prayers. Take our thoughts and inner hunger and join together in new and living path. The purpose of which is to cover and color this corner of your world with grace and love in Christ. Amen. This morning's scripture is Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you received from God. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. God has given his grace to each one of us, measured out by the gift that is given by Christ. That's why scriptures say, when he climbed up to the heights, he captured prisoners, and he gave gifts to people. What does the phrase, he climbed up, mean if it doesn't mean that he had gone down into the lower regions, the earth? The one who went down is the same one who climbed up above all the heavens so that he might fill everything. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. His purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son. God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. As a result, we aren't supposed to be infants any longer who can be tossed and blown around by every wind that comes from teaching with deceitful scheming and the tricks people play to deliberately mislead others. Instead, by speaking the truth with love, let's grow in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body grows from him. 
as it is joined and held together by all the supporting ligaments, the body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up with love as each one does its part. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Thank you for your help today, Glenn. Let's take a moment and pray together. God, we thank you for your work in our lives. We thank you for the gift of the scriptures, and we thank you for the way that you continue to use them to lead us, to guide us, to teach us. We pray that as we think together about uh, this word and what it means for us, that you might be present here, that we might hear you, that we might understand what it is that you have to say, and that we might uh, take it from here and put it into practice in the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So first of all, I can say this because I didn't put together this uh, sermon series, and um, you know Rachel did, and Rachel's not here. <clears throat> so I can say this. I don't really love the title of this week's message. I don't really love this word tolerance. So if Methodism is supposed to be a movement of hearts strangely warmed, the word tolerance really lacks that character. I remember a few years ago, I was having a conversation with my friend Tim Dayton, uh, who's the, um, he was, he passed away um, a couple of years ago, but he was the founder of Reach in Roanoke, which is one of our mission partners. And Tim and I were having a conversation. Reach is all about welcoming, loving people, meeting people where they are, um, just celebrating people being together. It's kind of a movement of community more than anything else. And I remember this conversation that he and I were having about what it means to really love and welcome people. And I remember this conversation that we had. He said, we talk sometimes about tolerance but the reality is that nobody wants to be tolerated. I mean, if your spouse just tolerates you, you are in trouble, right? That doesn't sound like a fun way to be. What we really want is to be loved, not tolerated. So maybe tolerance isn't the best word, but the more I think about it, I don't know what other choice we've got. The word tolerance has this kind of long history in religious use. When I look at Wesley, I don't see that Wesley ever used the word tolerance. Instead, he used the word latitudinarianism. So if I give you the choice between tolerance and latitudinarianism, which would you prefer? I think I'm going to stick with tolerance for the moment. It's too hard to say the other one. Whenever I reread Wesley, every time I come back to those original sources, and I enjoy going back to them and struggling with that 18th century English. I realize that even after having taken multiple classes in the history and the theology of Methodism, even after having read literally dozens of books, I try to read a little bit about Wesley, about the Methodist movement, about its contemporary significance. I try to read every year something along those lines. I still come to realize that I don't know the old man, as one of my professors used to call him, as well as I would like. For example, I was looking again at uh, John Wesley's famous sermon, Catholic Spirit. And not Roman Catholic, but Catholic meaning universal. That's the meaning of the word Catholic in a church context. In this sermon, John makes this argument for Christian unity. And this time I realized something. Because one of the things that I think that we frequently do with Wesley is we divorce him from his context. And we forget about the things that he was trying to deal with when he was writing. But when you read Catholic Spirit, you can definitely read it as a positive statement of Wesley's beliefs. But you can also read it very much as a plea to others that says, please don't hate us. Because people did hate Methodists. 
the kind of criticism that John and Charles faced when they were at Oxford. Rachel talked about that last week. It continued and it intensified. The more popular this movement became. And eventually, John was actually barred from preaching in most Anglican pulpits. Even though he was a priest in the Anglican church, he couldn't preach in Anglican churches. And so that leads to this famous scene where he goes back to the town where he grew up, Epworth, where his dad had been pastor. And he's not allowed to preach in the church, so he preaches standing on his father's grave in the cemetery outside the church instead. When he preached that God loved and forgave and that Christ had died for all people as opposed to just those whom God had elected for salvation, when he preached free grace versus predestination, people ridiculed him. Even his friends gave him a hard time. And then some of his ideas, like the notion of Christian perfection, which means that God is at work in us to so fully sanctify us, to make us so fully holy that we can be made perfect in love. Not sinless, but made perfect in love. So that when we screw up, we immediately know it. That our consciences are that quick. While people widely misconstrued and misinterpreted this, to the point where Wesley had to explain himself over and over and over again. No, here's what I mean by that. And if we don't believe that God can do that, then what do we believe? We should just be content with just kind of a mediocre experience of what it means to share God's love with others, to have God's love at work in us. No, we're aiming for something that's higher than that. And then when John started to open Methodist meeting houses that looked a lot like churches, well, people branded him a schismatic, a separatist, even to the point where he and his brother had a falling out over it, and his brother began to pull back from the movement as a result. But John held firmly to this idea that Methodism was not a denomination. He was proud of the fact that it wasn't just Anglicans who were coming out to Methodist meeting, but there were also Presbyterians and there were Congregationalists and even some Quakers and sometimes even a Roman Catholic. He argued that Methodism was not a set of beliefs, it wasn't a set of behaviors, as much as it was an approach to living out those things that we believe. So there was one famous tract that he wrote, a little pamphlet, 1742 is called the character of a Methodist and I'll paraphrase it just slightly in order to kind of um, walk around some of the the ways that people talked about uh, people in the 18th century where it was very male centric here's what he says the distinguishing marks of Methodists are not their opinions of any sort assenting to this or that scheme of religion, embracing any particular set of notions, are all quite wide of the point. What then is the mark? Who is a Methodist? I answer, Methodists have the love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost given unto them, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. This phrase, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. If you flip through the hymnal, you'll see it show up over and over. It was a phrase that Wesley used all the time. He loved this phrase. Now, it's unfamiliar to us. It doesn't sound like anything that we've heard because we don't read the Bible in the translation that John Wesley read it in. But it comes from Romans 5.5. Usually we translate it today as God's love is poured out in our hearts. Poured out in our hearts. What John is saying when he says that Methodists have the love of God shed abroad in their hearts is he's saying that his movement is just Christianity taken seriously. 
That's all it is. Loving God, loving our neighbor to the very best of our ability. That's all it is. As to all opinions that do not strike at the root of Christianity, Wesley wrote, we think and let think. So over the past few months, I find myself returning over and over again to a couple of themes, and to a couple of ideas that come from the New Testament. And in particular, we keep coming back to this idea of how the apostles navigated disagreement in the early church. There were so many big issues that they had to confront. As this movement began to grow, at every turn, there was something new that presented itself, a new challenge, a new question. The question of whether or not we should welcome Gentiles into the movement, that is non-Jews. If we welcome them, what are we going to ask of them? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to keep the law? How about all the dietary restrictions? What about this? What about that? What do people need to do in order to know Jesus? What do people need to do in order to be saved? And as a preacher, I keep coming back to these texts during this divisive time in the life of the church, in the life of the nation, to remind myself, and I think of it as reminding myself, and reminding you along the way, because you're along for the ride, that disagreement is normal. That it is not the exception, that it is the rule. That it's part of life. To quote Wesley, we cannot all think alike, and so consequently, we cannot all walk alike. I mean, what more do you want? What do you expect? You put three people in a room and you have four different opinions, at least. The writer of Ephesians, even in the first century, was dealing with dissension in the church and making an appeal to unity. And so, here's some of what we heard earlier. Accept each other with love. Make an effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one Spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. There's one Lord, there's one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all, through all, and in all. What this says to me is that in the church... We are one because God decreed that we are one. That this is what happens when we choose to be baptized. Now, we don't always like that because we don't like the idea of sharing our faith with people whom we disagree with. That makes us uncomfortable sometimes. But nonetheless, we share in this one baptism in this one spirit, in this one hope, and in this one love. And so what that means is, it's on us to figure out how to live that out. If we are called to be one, what does that mean exactly? So one of the things I often hear from people, and I've heard it kind of more and more as time goes on, is why do we have to talk about controversial things within the life of the church? I guess my short answer is because not talking about them does not make them go away. We can't will them out of existence by pretending that they don't exist. So if our strategy to think and let think is based on keeping silent about things that actually matter, then I'm just not interested. Like, you can count me out. Like, why am I here? I don't think that's valuable or important. Because when we choose to build the notion of think and let think around keeping silent, there are two things that happen. The first one is that our community becomes very shallow. 
It becomes very surface level. Because we're afraid to say what it is that we actually think. We're afraid for people to see us as we really are. And it becomes impossible for us to know and to understand the people around us. And that works, in my estimation, against unity. It works against unity because, based on everything that I've seen, it is much more in keeping with human nature for us to commit more readily to people than to commit to ideals. We commit to each other. We don't commit to a notion. We don't commit to a belief. We commit to each other. Because people matter to us. But second, when our unity is based on the things that we avoid talking about, I guarantee that there is someone somewhere who is being hurt by that silence. There just is. Somebody, and it may not be us, but there is somebody who is paying the price for the fact that we don't want to talk about something. When we don't talk about race, when we don't talk about women's rights, when we don't talk about the experiences of LGBTQ people in the life of the church, what we're saying in that moment is that certain people don't matter. Or that they matter less than we do. And I think that what we're doing in that moment is we're denying the reality of the scripture that says we're denying that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of us all. If we are one, then all of us have got to matter. So the question is, what do we do about that? in such a divisive time? You know, how can we understand and practice tolerance in a moment when the church is ready to split? Well, Wesley, in this sermon that I mentioned before, a Catholic spirit, he has this scriptural refrain that he keeps coming back to. It's from 2 Kings chapter 10. It's a really obscure passage. But in a modern translation, what it sounds like is this. Are you as committed to me as I am to you? If so, then give me your hand. Wesley's pulling out this refrain from Scripture to say, we don't need to agree on everything because that's just not possible. You know, you can keep your opinion, I'll keep my opinion. But for this tolerance thing to work, what has to happen is we need to be equally committed to each other, to each other's well-being. So what he says is, love me. He literally says that. Then love me. Love me as a friend who is closer than a brother. Love me so that you think no evil of me. Love me by commending me to God in all of your prayers. Love me not in word only, but in deed and in truth. Meaning that whatever practical or spiritual assistance that I'm willing to offer you, you need to be ready to reciprocate. All these things are right out of his sermon. So you can see that he sets a high bar for what it is that love looks like. That Wesley doesn't believe in just paying lip service to this notion of love and community and commitment to one another. It's not just about saying the right things. But it's about mutual care and concern and respect. It's about doing no harm. That was actually one of the first rules, the first rule of the Methodist movement. Three general rules. Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. Those are our three rules. And you're ordained, they ask you if you know the rules. Those are the rules. Perhaps the upshot of everything that we're saying today is that there really is no such thing as tolerance, but instead that there is only love. 
sure, we can achieve tolerance by having surface-level relationships, by ignoring differences, by not talking about things. We can achieve tolerance that way. But we can't ever have anything that looks like the Christian church without love. It's just not possible. So I'm sure you're wondering, you know, okay, well, how does this translate into the thing that we find ourselves in the middle of right now, the state of the United Methodist Church, and this division that we face when we think about human sexuality? Well, what I'd say is this. Within the church, we can disagree about any number of things. Some people really value traditional worship, would never think of going to a service where you put up drums in the sanctuary. Other people have a very particular understanding of how baptism must happen. We might argue over any number of theological kind of debates. There are plenty of things that, to use Wesley's phrase, do not strike at the root of Christianity. Plenty of things that we could debate. And where we might be able to acknowledge that each one of us has a point. But when we hear from people, when we hear from our LGBTQ siblings, that they are actively being hurt and harmed, by things that we've done or things that we failed to do because of words that we've spoken or because of positions that we've taken that deny them the ability to fully be part of the community. I believe that if we continue without addressing that harm, that at that point we are striking at the root of Christianity. Because what we've said already is that what we understand by Methodism, what we understand by Christianity, is to have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, poured out in our hearts. And love requires more of us than just paying lip service to unity. It requires much more of us than that. It requires more than just avoiding the difficult things. So then I think it should be clear that when we talk about tolerance within the context of who we are as United Methodists, it means something that's so much more than just putting up with. No one wants a spouse who just puts up with them. What we want is we want to be loved. And it's that simple. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for the fact that you have loved us. That you loved us first. That you love us fully. And that you call us into a relationship with you and with each other. We pray that you'd be at work in this community and in our church and in all the churches around the world. That you might lead us and guide us to navigate our differences with love and care and respect and commitment to one another's well-being so that we might genuinely be known by our love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. So one of the things that I like to do when we talk about the offering is just to celebrate some of the uh, great things that are happening. And one of the things that I think is truly a blessing, and I'm just marveling it um, as it happens, is I just want to give thanks today for new people who have been coming and worshiping with us over these past several weeks. And we're grateful for you. Uh, We thank God for you. And uh, however we can uh, be of assistance to you, we would love to be able to do that. We thank you for being here with us, and we celebrate your presence with us. And we want to continue to celebrate the fact that as we uh, meet, we pray together, we celebrate God's work among us, and that God continues uh, to draw people in. And so we thank you. If you'd like to make a gift today, you can do uh, drop something in the offering plate. You can also make a gift online at uh, medfordumc.org slash give uh, through our app or by mail. If you're online with us today, if you'd like to mail something to us, we're at 2 Hartford Road, Medford, New Jersey, 08055. So we thank you for your support. We're going to take some time now to pray together. And as we do that, I'm going to leave some space uh, in the prayer that I offer so that you can lift up your joys and you can lift up your concerns as well. If you're joining us online today, we encourage you just to uh, pray using the first names of folks uh, in the prayer, uh, in the comment section on Facebook. We are really grateful uh, for that um, respect given to those that you're praying for. Let's take a moment and uh, pray together. God, as we are gathered here, we thank you for those who are seated on our right and on our left, in front of us and behind us. We thank you for this community that you've called together over more than 200 years. You have called us together Sunday by Sunday. And we trust that when we are gathered together, that you are at work in us and among us. So we pray for the continued work of this congregation, that you would lead us and guide us into new opportunities to serve those in this community and beyond this community. And we pray that you continue to lead us and guide us into deeper opportunities for connection with each other. We know that you have loved us from the very beginning. And we know that you call us to love one another. So as we are gathered here this morning, we begin with our celebrations and our joys and the things that we give you thanks for. So what are some of those things here this morning that you bring into God's house? Amen. Amen. God, we thank you that in the midst of our lives, you give us the joyful things that we give you thanks for, and you give us the hard things that we can do nothing but walk with you through, sometimes be carried through by you and by those around us. You have heard our prayers here this morning, our concerns for people that are on our hearts. We know that there are others that we have not spoken, but that you know. So Lord, this morning as we are gathered, we thank you for your grace, for your power. We thank you for your healing touch at work in our lives and in the lives of those that we care about. As we go out into the world, We pray that you might give us wisdom to be able to live out the things that you are calling us to, that you might reveal to us your will, and that you might give us the courage to do it. We pray that we might learn to love as you have loved us. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So one of the first new hymns of the church was, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. But it's not so new anymore. If you remember when it came out, it was according to Bill and Love on the page, 1966. So that's like 57 years ago. So not new, but a great message that fits in with what Joe uh, had for us today. So not so new anymore, Joe. No, I guess not. It's been around the whole time you've been alive. <laughs> I remember when it came out. You might just stand as you're able. Friends, as you go forth in this place, go forth not to practice just tolerance of one another. Go, go forth to love one another, to love one another as Christ has loved you. Go forth in the name, the power of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen.